Today, I want to talk about how God saves and uses messed up people. And my, my desire, my hope, is that the story of Abraham, a man who is so flawed, but still used by God, would encourage us. And uh, I'd like to, first of all, talk about this story I'm going to concentrate on in Genesis 20. And then how the story has been repeated many times and how the story for you and me in our lives makes an impact. So what is this story? Well, in Genesis 20, we read a rather strange story about Abraham. And he has just had a visit in in Genesis 18 from two angels And uh, they tell him that within a year, he is going to become uh, the the, the father of Isaac, through whom the the whole world will be blessed. And he's given this promise. And uh, when you read this story, bear in mind that Abraham and Sarah are supposed to be great men and women of faith. So let's see how this plays out in the story. So let's look at this um, story together. Genesis 20. Abraham journeyed from there to the Negev region and settled between Kadesh and Shur. While he lived as a temporary resident in Gerar, Abraham said about his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. Now what's happening here is that he is afraid that somebody's going to see Sarah and say, uh, I want her as my wife. I'm going to kill her husband so I can have her, which could easily happen. But the, the, the weird, like, does this sound like a faithful husband to do this? I, I don't say, he's basically saying, you know, just say I'm your brother and then, you know, I won't get killed. Okay, you may get taken off by some other guy, but hey, I won't be killed. And, and, and also bear in mind, only just previously, he'd had a visit saying that through Sarah, he would become the father of great nations. And he would be the father. So what, you know, is this a great man of faith? Is he even a good husband? <laughs> so, so uh, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. Now, bear in mind, she is nearly 100 years old here. She must be an amazing woman for, some, for nearly a hundred for this guy to, to take her. Abimelech is a king of this local region. He sent for her, it takes her. But God appeared to Abimelech in a dream at night and said to him, you are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken, for she is someone else's wife. Now, Abimelech had not gone near her. He said, Lord... Would you really slaughter an innocent nation? Did Abraham not say to me, she's my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother. I've done this with a clear conscience and with innocent hands. So she's complicit in this lie about who she is. Then in the dream, God replied to him, yes, I know that you've done this with a clear conscience. That is why I've kept you from sinning against me and why I did not allow you to touch her. But now give back the man's wife. Indeed, he is a prophet and he'll pray for you. Thus you'll live. But if you don't give her back, know that you'll surely die along with all who belong to you. Early in the morning, Abimelech summoned all his servants. When he told them about these things, they were terrified. Abimelech summoned Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? What sin did I commit against you that you would cause that would cause you to bring such guilt on me and my kingdom? You've done things to me that should not have been done. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, What prompted you to do this thing? Abraham replied, Because I thought, surely no one fears God in this place. They'll kill me because of my wife. 
What's more, she is indeed my sister, my father's daughter, so she's his half-sister, but not my mother's daughter. She became my wife. When God made me wander from my father's house, I told her, this is what you can do to show your loyalty to me. Every place we go, say about me, he is my brother. So Abimelech gave sheep, cattle, and male and female servants to Abraham. He also gave his wife, Sarah, back to him. Uh, Abimelech said, look, my land is before you. Live wherever you please. To Sarah, he said, look, I've given a thousand pieces of silver to your brother. (laughs) This is compensation for you so that you will stand vindicated before all who are with you. Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech as well as his wife and female servants so they're able to have children. For the Lord had caused infertility to strike every woman in the household of Abimelech because he took Sarah, Abraham's wife. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that this is not a good story, the way it reflects on Abraham. Why is it there in the Bible? Like, what, what do you think we're supposed to learn from it? Can you tell me? Well, while you're thinking about it, um, there's a, in, you th- in case you're thinking that um, it's just Abraham, there's, a, there's a, another story about Sarah. So uh, I, won't, I won't give you the scriptures for it, but when the two angels came to tell them about the, the, the promised son, uh, Abraham was outside the tent, Sarah was in the tent, and the angel said, within a year, Sarah's going to be pregnant. Sarah laughed out loud, and she thought because she was in the tent, she forgot, they could hear her just as well, and the angel said, why did you laugh? And oh, she said, "Um, why should, you know, how can a woman who's so long past childbearing age possibly have a child? This is crazy. And it was recorded, and the, the, the angel said, no. This is going to happen. And so uh, in, in Hebrews, it tells us about the faith of Sarah and Abraham. And they were people of faith. But it, wasn't, it was a very imperfect faith. So let's go back then to my question. What, why is this there in such detail? Yeah? You can come up here and preach the rest of the sermon. <laughs> Did you catch that? Like if Abraham is full of flaws, then and God can still use him. This is my message today. Yeah, yeah. This is my message that, that, that this is why the story is there in so much detail about his brokenness and his flawedness and to encourage us um, and, uh, and Sarah similarly with her brokenness. So... So, uh, well, how does the story go, goes on? If Sarah had got pregnant from Abimelech, it would have broken God's promises. It would have been a mess. Actually, there's another player in this game. It's Satan. And he is trying to attack and destroy. And he wants to put fear. Did you see that? It's the fear that's behind it all. Abraham is terrified that he's going to get killed. He's afraid. He's not trusting God because of this fear. Greater than his faith. And the, next, the very next verses, after this account, if we look at the next chapter, it begins, the Lord visited Sarah just as he'd said he would and did for Sarah what he had promised. So Sarah became pregnant and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the appointed time God had told him. Abraham named his son, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. God did what he said he would and kept his promise. And... The moral of the story, as we've just said, God was faithful. God kept his word and kept through and didn't um, say, oh, you're a failure, Abraham. I'm going to just find somebody else. Um, And actually, this was the second time Abraham had done this. He did it earlier um, in Egypt when they went down to Egypt. And again, God rebuked him for it. Um, so, So... I think that um, this is there in detail in the Bible for us to learn. There's nothing in the Bible that's there with no value. We are to learn from it. So uh, that was my first point, the story. The second, I want to talk about how it's been repeated and uh, how this story is not just one, but as many. 
and then we'll end up by looking about how it reflects on us. So uh, God still uses messed up people, and although we may relapse and fail, God is faithful. Um, can you think of anyone else in the Bible who was a messed up person who yet God used? S Samson, David, yeah. Hmm? All of them, yes. <laughs> All of them. Peter, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, King David, we know, murdering and adultery, like, and God still used him. Um, uh, well, another one from the New Testament, uh, who did God choose to evangelize Samaria? Did he say, like, who's the most perfect, amazing person in Samaria that I can get to be my evangelist? It was the woman at the well, the one who'd already had how many husbands? But yeah, and the one she was living with wasn't her husband, and Jesus picked her as his evangelist to bring the gospel to Samaria. Um, one of you mentioned Peter, who denied Jesus and Jesus restored him. Uh, another one would be the woman who anointed the feet of Jesus, and I'll come back more to that later. But uh, even today, the same thing is happening, and I want to... Uh, talk about the, the story of a guy called Sean, who I met a number of years ago. And uh, this is a picture I took of him as we were talking. Um, and uh, Sean, um, his, he had quite an interesting story. From a very young age, his dad taught him how to break into places, how to pick locks. His dad would sometimes bring new locks home and show them how to break them in. Uh, as a young boy at school, he discovered some drugs and he came and showed them to his dad. And his dad says, this is good, but I want a cut of any money you make from selling these. And so his dad pushed him in this direction and uh, he was quite violent at school, um, really getting into trouble all the time. And... Uh, 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 he, because of his extreme violence, he did his first prison term at the age of 17. Uh, when he came out of prison, he discovered this white powder called heroin, which was absolutely like he'd not experienced anything like that before. And he showed his dad and his dad, hey, this is really good. You've got to make a lot of money from this. And, um, but it was very expensive to buy. So he decided that... Um, he would have to, to rob places, of course, to get money for it. But why don't you um, do both at the same time and actually rob the drug dealers? And then, you know, you can get your... And uh, this was not a good idea. He got himself a great big double-barreled sawn-off shotgun, attacked the drug dealers. A whole nasty situation. He was put in prison. It was seven years he was in prison for it. Would have, it would have been shorter had he not tried to kill someone else in prison. Uh, so he came out of prison um, really you know, no better off at all, just heavily into heroin. And one day um, he, and, he and his friend, were they, were they weren't actually high, but at that time they were just walking along the street. And his, they walked past a church and his friend said, hey, why don't we go in there? And the guy said, are you crazy? Why would we want to go in there? Sean said, but, okay, well, let's go in for fun. So they went in. And they listened to the, guy, the, the pastor. And at the end, the pastor came up and said hello to them. And he discovered what was going on in their lives. And he said to, to Sean, look, I know a place where they help people like you. And, and Sean said, well, will they feed me? He said, yes, they'll feed you. Oh, Sean says, I'll go, if they'll feed me, I'll go there. So the guy bought him a train ticket to Birmingham, where, where this place was. This, is in, this all happened in the UK, by the way. But a train ticket to Birmingham. So uh, he went there. He was got high on the train, but he arrived at this place and they fed him and gave him a place to stay. And uh, he, um, he said to them, um, oh, you know, what are the rules? And they said, well, you can't have any heroin while you're here. You're joking. No, you've got to go cold turkey and we'll pray for you. So he went cold turkey and he didn't sleep. And after 30 days of sleeping, he was absolutely crazy his mind was was just sorry not say sorry after 30 days of not sleeping his mind was just crazy just like insane and one day lying on his bed in the middle of the night he thought what's going on oh, this is i'm getting he got up and he went downstairs and he sat down and he saw a bible and he thought oh this is the stuff these people believe in um and he thought well 
let's have a look at it. So he took it up and he opened it up and the, there was a verse about prayer, about God answering prayer. So he said, God, if there's a God, give me sleep now. Bang. <laughs> he woke up the next morning with his face, had done a face plant in the Bible. And he looked up and there was the promise he just read. So, okay, well, maybe I should follow this God. And uh, he, God turned his life around. He was saved, radically saved, but um, he still had relapses. He still did, her, you know, ran off, did heroin again, had to come back. But, you know, he put his life together. It was a very good community for helping him get restored. And, and guess what? God decided to use him. God gave him these amazing leadership gifts. And when I got there, when I spoke to him, he was actually running the whole place. And not only that, but his next plan was that the organization said, we want to start a, a ministry. It's called Betel. We want to start a Betel in Australia. Or we want you to head it up. And he went to Australia. He was going to go to Australia. And uh, I looked online in Australia, Betel is thriving. So he obviously did a good job. So this is the guy, this broken guy, that God decided to use so powerfully and impact so many people's lives. Um, but uh, I could give you, I could give you many stories of men and women who this has happened to. I'm just going to give you one more. Uh, this is a guy uh, called William Cooper. And William Cooper... Uh, struggled with depression and suicide. Very, very flawed and damaged person. Um, he actually lived at the same time as John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. And uh, uh, he, John Newton encouraged him to write. And he wrote some, some hymns. And he wrote some of my favorite hymns. I'll just give you a couple um, that William Cooper wrote. It's written Cowper, it's pronounced Cooper. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. This is one of my favorite because like, this is like, there's, there's plenty of blood to wash your sins away. And you can imagine him writing this. I'm such a bad person. I need like a lake of blood to wash my sins. But like there's plenty for, for what Jesus has done, figuratively, of course, to cleanse my sin. Um, here's another one that he wrote. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. So he's writing these out of his disability. He's writing these out of his depression, suicidality. And I, I mean, that wasn't that all the time. He had bouts of it. But uh, in his, when he was able to trust God, he actually used the, the, the bad stuff to actually praise God. And this last verse there, this is a wonderful one for us to take. You know, there are clouds that we dread, and you've probably got clouds in your life. I have clouds in mine, whether they're near or far, and you dread them. And he said, uh, you, those clouds are actually are going to break with blessings, not with, with thunder and lightning on your head. Just trust the Lord in this. And he wrote those things out of his brokenness. So, God saves and uses messed up people. We looked at the story in Genesis. We've looked at some play, other times it's been repeated. And I want to now ask the question, how, what does this story do for you and me? Why has God done this? And I would say three things. God has done this to reveal his love and compassion, just to show us what a God of love he is. Um, He's done it so that we don't try and claim we earned it because we're not, you know, we're a mess and God comes and saves us. It's all of grace. And uh, I was listening earlier to Dan saying that, you know, he felt grace as a theme for the singing. I was thinking, oh, yeah, that fits in pretty well with what I'm saying today, speaking on grace. Um, and so it's all about grace and uh, also that we will love him even more. And I said at the beginning I was going to, going to give you another story at the end of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her hair. 
and it's in Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the town who was a sinner, and she was probably a prostitute. When she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. They would have lain down. They wouldn't sit on chairs to eat. They'd have lain down so she could be behind, but behind his feet. Um, wet his feet with her tears and wiping them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus heard his thoughts and answering said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. And Jesus said, told him a story. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii, the other 50 denarii. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he cancelled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said, he said to Simon, you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. And so she loved much, but he who's forgiven little, loves little. So I want to argue that... Um, that Jesus is telling us here that part of the way he, the, he, he loves the broken is because the broken are likely to respond better and with, with greater love than those who think they have everything together. And I want to say, <clears throat> um, if you're not a Christian today, these stories should be really encouraging to you, unless, of course, you're perfect in which case then you probably won't be encouraged by today. But if you feel that you've got problems and you've got brokenness, God loves to save the broken. He loves to do that. And he does not want your want perfection. He wants your love. And so to really to try and summarize, and this is my last slide today, the story for you and for me. God still uses really messed up people and saves really messed up people. There are two kinds of people, those who don't know they are messed up and those who do. And I would say um, it's either obvious you're messed up or you hide it well this morning. <laughs> because all of us are messed up this morning. All of us go back uh, again and again into things we shouldn't do. The enemy is defeated. He's going down, but he's not without a fight. He's going to attack us. And God is able to pull you out of those jaws every time. So uh, what kind of man of, of faith are you, Abraham? What, what sort of faith? Well, in the long run, it actually didn't change God's, the destiny God had for him because God was going to show him love and, and take him to his destiny. And one of the things that encourages me um, about this story, uh, although we may relapse and fail, God is faithful and God is going to bring me through to what he has for me, even though I may mess up and be very, very imperfect. Um, <clears throat> One th another thing that really encourages me is that this really supports the Bible being from God. I mean, if men had written the Bible, would they have put that story in there? Abraham's supposed to be, you know, the father of the faith. Would they put the stories of David if, they, if the whole thing was made up? I don't think so. No other religion does that to its, you know, its, its, the founders of the, of the faith. They don't do that. It's a testimony to this being reality that this is how people really are, that supports, that this, this is not just uh, some made-up story, but this is truth that we're reading. And um, uh, so 
why does God even record it in such detail? And I think he records it in such detail because um, we are really to, uh, to see ourselves in this and to come to God and say, God, please treat me like you did to Abraham. Please forgive me like you did to him. Please uh, rescue me. And I, I would say to you that what Satan wants to do, he wants to paralyze us. He wants to paralyze us and discourage us from entering into God's purpose. He wants us to freeze us by get with guilt. He wants to, to tell us, oh, you're not good enough to serve God. Why should you, sir? You're so flawed. Why should you do this? And so this morning, I want you to tell Satan, uh, it happened to Abraham and God still used him. God can use me, uh, just like he used Abraham. Step away from fear this morning and say, God has not given up on me. God's love is far, far stronger than all of these failures. Is God's love stronger than your failure this morning? Is it? Do you believe that? You hold on to that because that is how God wants to show his love to you and receive your love back from him. So I'm just going to close in prayer now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these extraordinary stories that you've preserved for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you've done it because you want us to see ourselves in those stories and be encouraged. And Lord, if we don't know you this morning as our Savior, Lord, may we be encouraged just to come to you, to throw ourselves on you and say, Lord, please save me because I, I need you. And if we are following you this morning, Lord, I pray that Satan will not be allowed to point to our brokenness, but we will say to, to you, Lord, Lord, I thank you that you love saving the broken. You love saving the messed up. It's your joy to come and save the imperfect because that reflects who you are. I thank you, Lord. Lord, you are beautiful. Lord, this part of your nature is so beautiful. I want to praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen.